I am starting everything up here, so I have no idea if you're seeing this yet or not. Everything is kind of kicking on, so I'm just waiting a second to see if the live feeds are going up. Um, <clears throat> it looks like things are starting up here. Uh, it says on my unit here that we are broadcasting. I'm just looking over here. i got a computer set up, and it hasn't hit the airwaves yet over there. It's about a 30 second to a minute time lag between what I'm actually doing here and what is going to appear on the computer over there, I think. Um, so I'm just kind of waiting here a minute to see if things get started up. Okay, I just saw it come up over there on my computer and what I'm saying right now is going to appear over there in about a minute. So I just want to welcome everybody. This is exciting. We got a, a new series we're starting up here. Uh, my name is Sean McVeigh with Sean's Outdoor Adventures. I am partnering with Bowtech to bring you this live series here. And we're going to call it Hunting Strategies. And the focus here is, you know, the hunting season is coming. And a lot of us are getting psyched up for that. I know I am. All my buddies are. And um, we're, we're getting ready. And so this series is to try to get you in that mind, mind, that mindset and some ideas to help you get ready with strategies going into this hunting season. I think that the more we have good strategies going into the season, the more successful we can be. So that's kind of the background of why hunting strategies and why now. Um, and a little bit more background too as we're waiting for people to get on here is... Um, it's neat how this came together. I actually reached out to Bowtech uh, to see if they wanted to be involved with this um, map reading challenge that I'm doing with like, I got 12 guys that I'm taking out on a challenge hunt. And I, then one of them got back to me from Bowtech right away and said, hey, well actually, would you be interested in doing a live uh, show with us on, you know, well, we didn't have a title. They just wanted me to do something to help people get ready for the hunting season. And so, yeah, I was like, sure. So I came up with the idea, let's call it hunting strategies, because we want to put together some good strategies going into this hunting season. And that's what this is going to be all about. Tonight's episode is going to focus mainly on wind direction and thermals in hilly terrain. Uh, the reason why I can speak on that is because I grew up and live in the state of Pennsylvania. I've been hunting in Pennsylvania for 30 years for whitetail deer and longer for small game as well. And I have had many hunts, many, many hunts ruined because of the wind and the thermals. And I have learned a lot along the way. And so my hope tonight is to share that information with you to help you be more successful going into this hunting season. And that you're going to develop a good hunting strategy based on this kind of information. Uh, before I get into that content though, I was actually driving my kids to preschool this morning and I was saying a little prayer to God saying, you know what Lord, help me say some things that are going to be really helpful for the people that are watching. And while I was sort of saying that prayer, I just had this idea come to me and I want to share it with you. And it came from this past weekend. My parents who live about three hours away were actually visiting and I got my dad set up with the Diamond, S, the Diamond Edge SB1. Um, it wasn't even Bowtech. I was actually asked by another company who was getting into selling bows if I would do a review on that bow because they wanted to know my opinion. So I did a review on the video, which is on my Sean's Outdoor Adventures YouTube channel. If you haven't been there, make sure you check it out. And I get hundreds of people uh, thanking me for that video and a lot of people you know, have purchased the bow because they liked the, the video. And I did, it, I did it like all my videos in an unbiased way. I had no affiliation with Bowtech at the time. And um, anyway, I was setting my dad up with that bow and here's the reason why. And this is the point. So maybe each week I'm gonna give a little, I'm gonna start us off with a, a tip in archery that you can be implementing in your practice right now as you're getting ready for hunting season. And then we'll roll into the meat of the rest of the content. But the tip for this week is going to be relating to draw length and anchor point. And the reason why I set my dad up with the Diamond Edge SB1 is because, one, it has an incredible span when it, when you come to the draw length. You can really adjust it 
in a lot of ways. I also know that the bow my dad has been shooting, it's too long for him. I, I was down at his house maybe two years ago. We broke the bow out and we were working on the sighting of it a little bit. And when I was watching him come to full draw, and here's part of the point I want you to think about this week, is I could see his hand was coming back too far that the crux of the string was back here a little bit far. He was kind of reaching like this to anchor in. And that is not helpful when you want to be consistent and accurate. What you really want, and here's my encouragement to you, is really analyze your draw length this week and how you're anchoring. So for my dad, I wanted to shorten up that draw length. And another reason why is his hand was back here floating around. And it's hard to have a solid anchor point when your hand's back here floating around. So all of, all of you who are viewing, the next time you shoot your bow, take it and, you know, just look at where is your hand back here. And if you're one of those people who's floating around back here, this is something I'm encouraging you to address now so that going into the hunting season, you will be used to a change. Maybe you can make a change to it now and you can get used to that change because it takes a little while. When we start changing things around on our archery setup, it can take us a little bit to get used to it. So most of us have at least an, a month, some of us two months before the hunting season starts. And this is something we want to get solidified now. So my encouragement is this, and I'll also throw this in. I have a playlist on my YouTube channel called Archery Tips and Bow Tuning. If you're watching this stream on my YouTube channel, there's a card I already set up for you for that uh, playlist. So in that, I, um, I have a a newer video called five hot tips to better archery accuracy it's one of the first ones in the playlist and in anchoring i talk about i prefer to have three touch points i knows i have a little kisser button and i actually use a knock that i've clamped on the string as a kisser button rather than a big kisser button because i just like the little sensitivity of it and i put that right in the corner of my lip here when i'm aiming so i got a touch point here touch point here and then for me if I'm using a wrist strap style release, I like to take this part of my hand and put it right in my jaw right here. So that's locked in nice and tight. I got a touch point here, touch point here. That helps me be consistent every time. That also helps my accuracy. So my encouragement to you is if, you're, if your hand is not solid back here, work on that this week. Get it solid. If you need to shorten up the draw length so it comes in here, or maybe shorten, if you're using a wrist strap style, shorten the neck on the release here if you can, so that your hand comes forward more. Like, you could be a full jaw, but if that strap is shortened up, your hand can come in tighter. Things like that, uh, solidify that. Work on maybe getting three touch points. I really think that can be helpful in your archery accuracy. So, that would be my tip for this week. And some of you, you might need to go to a shorter draw length, like I said, and that's why I used a diamond for my dad because his other bow, we had it at the shortest draw length and it was still too long. So there you have it. Now, um, and here's something for you who are new to me and aren't familiar with me and my YouTube channel. I am pretty much a one man show. When I'm filming hunts, I'm by myself. When I'm making videos, I'm by myself. Right now, I don't have a cameraman, I have a camera hand. And so I'm gonna to have to call on the camera hand and we're gonna move on over here. I actually set this whiteboard up for tonight's presentation. Um, I wanna talk about wind direction and thermals, especially in hilly terrain. So I wanna draw some stuff out to give you a visual. So this is like, I'm not just saying words. I want everyone to be able to picture what I'm talking about. And so, um, I've got a couple color markers here. I got black, orange, and, or excuse me, red and green. So I'm gonna use the different colors for different things. How convenient. Oh, and while I'm getting these ready, I, um, my wife is helping me out tonight in a covert way. She is upstairs. Uh, I don't even know where, maybe in the bedroom. We, her cousin has come to babysit the children. We have four. And so she's gonna to try to monitor some of the feeds to get your questions so that I can try to answer them. So again, there's a little bit of a time lag here. Like while, what I'm saying right now is not actually gonna be broadcasting for another 30 seconds to a minute. And so we have that challenge. Also, my wife is gonna be texting me uh, questions as they come in. So feel free to throw out your questions now and she's gonna, we're broadcasting all over the place. My YouTube channel, Botex uh, YouTube channel, their Facebook page, their website, the diamonds pages, uh, all so 
so we're all it's going all over the place i don't know where you're watching but some of the main ones i think she's going to be watching is my youtube page uh, botex facebook page and probably their youtube channel uh but the main two would be my youtube channel and their facebook page make your comments in those two if you can it'll be easier for her to find them because i want to answer your questions if by chance i don't get to your question or there's just too many comments and stuff going on in between all the feeds and we miss it uh, this is going to stay up on my youtube channel so feel free to post a question in the comment section under the video i do my best to answer every comment that comes through so if i don't get to your question hit me up there and i will do my best to get to you there all right so this what i want to talk about now is first i want to talk about wind direction and how that can be impacted and manipulated by hills and mountains and uh, this is something that really messes us up a lot as hunters and so i can't solve every problem with the way the hills and the mountains you know redirect the wind but i can give you a few ideas that you can take to your hunting area that maybe you can implement it's going to help your success this year so i live in pennsylvania i hunt in pennsylvania new york maryland i'm planning to get down to virginia one of these years and what we have in a lot of these areas, especially Pennsylvania, Virginia, is Long Ridge Mountain. So picture this ridge that runs for six miles this way, and it has a peak the whole way, you know, maybe a few bumps here and there. But this, it just goes a long way. So first I want to talk about ridges and what that does to the wind direction. And then I want to talk more about just your, your mountain and hill. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the end of a ridge. So imagine that we're looking at the end of a ridge here and it runs for six miles that direction. Let's say it runs from north to south. So we're looking at the north end of the ridge and the south is at the other end. So that's gonna put the east of the, the east side over here and the west side over here. All right, so now think about this and what is the wind going to be doing? Let's say we're getting an east wind today. So the wind is going this way at 20 miles an hour. What is going to happen when that wind hits the side of this ridge? It's going to get pushed up this way. Now what you need to remember is that you also have 20 mile an hour winds coming like this. So what happens when this wind meets that, it actually does like uh, a big swirl effect. It's almost like the crest of a wave and it comes over on this side of the hill. Let me just share with you what happened when I really started to realize that this is what was happening in a lot of my hunting situations. I actually woke up one morning at 2 a.m., got ready, drove two and a half hours to a hunting spot in Maryland. It was my last chance to hunt for the year. It was the late season, very cold, January, might have been about 10 degrees. 25 mile hours was the low for the wind direction. It gusts up to 40. It was going to be wicked, and I knew it was going to be hard and cold. So here's what I thought. We were going to be getting, in that situation, let me just reverse these. So this here, this here was the west side of the ridge. Oops. This was the east side of the ridge and down here was the south end of the ridge. Okay, so I was near the south end of the ridge because that's where the spot was that I had scouted out in the early, you know, in the summertime before the season started. And I had not had a chance to hunt this spot. Now, I wanted to the whole season because it was so good looking. Um, so I was kind of toward the south end of the ridge. And I thought with the wind blowing as hard as it was across there, I'm going to get low on the ridge and maybe, you know, maybe this whole ridge side is going to buffet this wind and slow it down so that it's not as bad on the back side. So I set up, let me use the black marker here. I, I set up in a tree stand really low on the ridge, like right here. And while I was in the stand that morning, well, let me say this too. When I got there, there was fresh green deer scat everywhere. And I was like, yes. There's been deer here and a lot and re recently and frequently. But when I was in the tree stand, and of course the ridge, by the way, the, the hillside wasn't quite this steep. So my drawing isn't to scale. It was more, you know, sloped out that way. But anyway, I'm in the tree stand and the whole morning, it was like the wind was blowing from the east 
and taking my scent right up the hillside, right like this, and all the deer I knew from tracking them when I was scouting and you know, you kind of get an idea where the food sources are and where the bedding areas are and the deer tracks from the food, the feeding areas toward where I knew they were bedding were all downhill. So I knew in the morning they were going to be coming downhill. And I thought in my mind with a west wind coming this way, you know, in my mind the wind was still blowing this way even though I was on that side of the ridge. And that wasn't happening because of what I'm talking about, this swirl effect. And it was blowing very hard, so it was having a major impact even at the very bottom of the hill. And it ruined my hunt. I didn't see a single deer. I, you know, sat in that freezing cold for hours upon hours upon hours. Now, what would have been maybe a better strategy? And maybe something that I didn't want to think about going into the hunt, because it was really cold. You have this blowing hard wind from this side. Maybe a better strategy for me that day would be, okay, where are the deer going to be coming from down in here? Okay, and heading up. So if I was in a tree stand location here, obviously my scent is going to be driven uphill, the deer coming uphill, I might have had a chance at. And that's my point to you. In your hunting strategies, think about the wind direction, and I want you to, oh, I almost forgot an important point. The way this was really driven home clear to me is after I got down after that morning hunt, I drove to the top of the ridge, the top of the mountain, and I stood there facing west, and it was just blasted me. I was like, oh man. So that's when the light bulb started to go off. This is what is happening here when I'm in this kind of a situation. Let's complicate things a little bit. Let me erase this. And while I'm erasing, I want you to be thinking about your hunting spots, and it doesn't have to be a huge mountain either. Even hilly terrain, that can have an impact on how the, the air is moving. So you just keep this in mind. That swirling effect is what really hurts us as hunters. And don't forget, um, I don't see any text yet, so hopefully, you know, you're still pondering. So anyway, let's complicate this. Let's say there's a little hill here, a little hill here, a ridge that runs this way, and then you're, you're hunting, you like my, these are, these are some funny looking hills, aren't they? I'm glad I'm not an artist. All right, let's say you're hunting on this one. Let me fix this a little bit. This is terrible. Come on. Gotta, gotta be able to draw a hill these days, come on. All right, so let's say your hill's more like this, all right? Now you have all this nonsense over here. Let me just take this pathetic ridge out real quick. Now the wind is coming across here. When it hits this, now let's say this is just like an uh, ice cream cone, you know, a, a regular hill. It's not like a ridge because w with that long running ridge, it's basically like a wall. Now when you have just a hill, that air is going to hit it and come around it and over it and that is just going to really mess with things. Okay, so now you have wind hitting this hill here coming around it on both sides and up over it. And you have the wind that's coming across the top that's going to be swirling with that. The same thing happening on that next hill back, so now you've got this massive swirl effect. So you got this massive swirl effect coming into this. So now that game plan that we had in the last little drawing where, you know, if you just sit on this hillside, you're in better shape. Well, this is going to be causing a lot of switching and turning and that wreaks havoc for us as hunters. Those of you who are watching who hunt in mountainous areas, and I especially can relate to all the Eastern coast hunters, the people in Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, where we have lots of hills. And I mean, there's areas too in some of these states that are flatter, like New Jersey has mountains and a lot of flatness. Um, but what you know that when you're in the stand, the wind's blowing this way one minute, it's blowing that way the next, it's blowing that way the next, or you're predominantly getting a west wind when the weatherman said an east wind. Again, it's coming back to this. My ideal conditions, regardless of wind direction, is when it's calm, like five mile an hour winds, because that's when you can get away with the most as a hunter. It's hard to come by those days, but they do come by. So 
when those days are coming up, that's where I really put my chips. I'm like, okay, this is a day I need to focus on. If I can get out on this day because the wind is gentler, that's what I want to do. Okay, uh, making sure every, is everything going okay over here. I just uh, try to keep my any human odor I might have in. I mean, we wash our clothes and the scent elimination stuff. We do everything we can, but sometimes, um, you know, there's just like I carry a camera bag every time I go in. Sometimes that camera bag over the course of the season starts to develop its own odor and it's not something I can put in the washing machine. I mean, I spray the bag down with scent elimination stuff, but it's tough sometimes. And I'm getting, let's see. Okay. Oh. All right, so what should I do? It looks like the uh, the stream just got. I don't know if it's restarting. I don't know technology so I refreshed my page and I don't know if this is gonna repopulate but I'll keep talking uh, I refreshed my YouTube page to see if it was working and apparently in doing that it um, killed everything so I'm waiting to see I'm waiting for instructions here okay keep going he says okay those of you who are still watching with this nonsense going on, I apologize. Uh, new, first time doing this, so we got some kinks to work out. Um, all right, I wanna continue on now. I wanna talk a little bit about thermals. Let's draw our hill again. There's our hill, and... Okay. Keep going, keep going, they say. Let's talk about thermals. All right, let's say that um, on this hill right here, um, this is a ridge, just like we were talking about before. Now, on this particular ridge, this side over here, no, wait, let's make this south. Let's make this side, this is the south side of the hill. This is the east side. So obviously this is the north and then the other end is the west, like all the way at the other end of the hill. So now we know that the sun rises from the east and sets in the west. So we've got the sun coming up, you know, kind of going across here. In especially the south and the east facing sides of hills and slopes, those are the areas I like to focus on in morning hunts because those are going to heat up first right here, this, these areas are going to heat up from the sun hitting them first. So what happens when temperature, when air, anything heats up, hot air rises. And so what's going to happen is this air is heating up over here and it starts to create an upward draft up the hillside. Let's see, I'm getting a text to see if we have any. Okay. Okay. So that, that air that's heated up here, it creates a thermal. It's gonna drive it up that hillside. Now, what's the best vantage point for a deer in that situation? Where can a deer wind anything below it on the hill? That's gonna be up in this region, you know, up, up in these areas up here. My experience hunting the hills and the mountains, some of the best bucks that I've jumped and some of the best, best buck beds I've found where you find a deer bed and you're like, that's a big body. They're up here. They're in this zone right here. And they're on the south and southeast and east facing slopes that I've come across. And the reason is because they're, I think, is because they're catching that thermal. Now, when the sun's coming up and it's heating up these sides, where's some of the last places that sun is going to hit? Over there on the north and the west sides. So they're not getting any advantage over there from a thermal for scent detecting things. And of course we know the biggest defense line for a deer is its sense of smell. 
So in the morning, when you are planning your morning hunts and you're thinking about where should I set up in the morning, some of my best morning spots that I like are in this zone on a south or an east or a southeast facing slope because a lot of times the deer are moving through those areas getting ready to bed down because they can, you know, obviously if you've got 25 mile an hour winds, it's not going to have the same effect because depending on which way the wind is blowing, it's just going to be blasting everything. But if it's a calm morning, like a lot of times we have a calm morning in the early season and the sun, it's not cloudy, the sun's coming up, so it's heating up that slope, it's going to naturally drive that air up and it's going to create a good hunting environment for you because you know that there's a lot of deer that are going to utilize that. So that's, that's in the evening time, but what about, I mean, that's in the morning time, but let's talk about the evening because something different happens in the evening. And before, oh, let me say this too. Um, in the summertime, when things are super duper hot, um, in the summertime, when things are very hot, um, a lot of times I find deer beds low on the west and the north sides of the hills. And obviously that's because I want to keep cool. Last year we had a record hot year in the, in the month of November for the state of Iowa. Well, it was a world record. I mean, since they started logging, um, you know, temperatures and stuff, it was the hottest November on record for Iowa. And I, it was my first time hunting in Iowa. <laughs> so it was a very difficult scenario because the deer, they had their winter coat on, their winter fat, and it was blazing hot a lot of the days. So there was, you know, some of the deer movement wasn't what people were expecting. Now in that kind of a situation, if you have a deer with all that heat, you know, the, the coat and the and where's the best place for the deer to bed down to try to stay cool? In those situations, it, they might not be choosing this. They might be looking for areas they can hide. Well, it depends on the hunting pressure too. Pressured deer are going to look for places where hunters are not going and where they can hide easily or get away from hunters. So think about your hunting spots, especially if you're a public land hunter like I am. Think about those conditions where the, you're getting into the later part of the season, closer to the rut. Sometimes we've been having those hot days. Are there some areas, even in the northern and western facing slopes, that might give the deer a chance to cool off or stay cool, but also where other hunters might not be looking? So those areas can actually become hot spots, and I want to point that out because it's easy to get your mind locked on things. Like if I do this and I do that, I'll be successful such as I'm going to be successful. That's not always the case. We have for deer especially. And so when, when, I'm, when the conditions are right, we're going to look for maybe our thermal spot in the morning. When, they, when it's hotter than normal, maybe we're going to look for a backup spot over here. So that can be part of your strategy. Of course, you're going to have to factor in the wind. What's the wind doing that day? How is it going to be impacted? And that's a challenge with hills. But that's what I wanted to talk about with that morning thermal. But now, like I said, I want to look at an evening thermal. Let me, let me just clean this up a minute. Uh, we can keep everything else pretty much the same. Uh, north, south, east, west. Okay. Um, all right, so here's our hillside. And this is something that, I, here's an idea I want to throw into you, especially if you're somebody who can only get an hour of hunting in after a work day. Like maybe by the time you get off work and you get to a hunting spot and you maybe only have an hour to hunt. Well, what I'm about to talk to you about might give you an edge to really be successful, even on a good buck. So in the evening time, we have somewhat of a reverse of what we had in the morning time. The sun is going down which means air temperatures are beginning to cool down and drop off. I'm just seeing I got, okay. Checking the text message, I heard a buzz over there. Okay, so um, temperatures are cooling off. Now, hot air rises, cold air drops, because it's heavier, colder air is heavier. I know from experience that last 45 minutes, especially in the time of year where it, the temperature changes are greater from cold to hot, you know, nighttime getting cold, heating up during, during the daytime, 
you really feel that temperature dropping when you're in the tree stand. And what happens in our thermals is with that cold air dropping, it creates a thermal, a draft down the hillside. And now that's going to be universal. It's going to be here and here. You know, if we take wind direction out of the equation for a second, we're going to have this dropping effect. Now in the morning, remember, it was a south and east facing slopes that were heating up and we were getting that up thermal. But in the evening time, it's coming down. It's going to happen quicker, though, I think, in a lot of situations on those south and east facing slopes because they're losing sunlight sooner. Um, but you're going to have this effect. Now, how does that impact us as hunters? Well, their deer movement can be all over this hillside. It's not always going to just be at the top down, although that is a very common thing that I observe hunting the hills. A lot of times a deer are bedding up high and coming down in, in the evening times. Not always the case though, but a lot of times. There can be deer bedded down all over the place and working their way around the hillsides to preferred feeding areas. I hunt on a lot of public land, but off in the distance are crop fields. And so I know how the deer use the topography to get over to those crop fields. And a lot of times that's their end goal. They want to get to those crop fields off in the distance. So they might be coming around these hills and over these hills on their way there. How's that? Here's the thing I was getting at for you one hour hunters at the end of the hunt. If all you have is an hour and you have a situation, something like this, try to find a spot low on the hillside that could get deer movement before dark. Obviously, that first week of the season, I'm going to talk about different strategies throughout the season in another episode. Um, okay, my wife just texted me that she can't find me live on any site. I'm going to keep going because the broadcaster says I'm going. And the last thing I got from the guy, Tim from Bowtech, is that I'm still going at least on one site. So I'm just going to keep going. And we'll just figure these glitches out come the next time. I won't refresh the page uh, on the YouTube page. So anyway, um, coming in the evening time, we've got this thermal coming down. Let me throw this into the equation. Let's say you go out and sit in the stand for four hours and it was a north wind. So your stand is, let's say your stand is right here, and you had a north wind the whole time, so the wind is being driven up here, it's taking your scent up all over this, you might be getting that swirl effect down, so a deer could even be winding you on the back side of that hill if the wind is swirling like that. So now, all the deer above you on this hillside know you're there, they're not coming. But that last hour, 45 minutes, if you've ever noticed this, it, very often things calm down. The winds die down for a little bit, and that's when these thermals have a much bigger role to play in the hunt. So now if you're coming in right after or right as that's happening, that shift is happening, those deer haven't winded you because you're just slipping in now right when that is dying off. Now you're getting into your spot, that thermal's kicking in, bringing the natural draft down. You're not winded. The deer we're smelling nothing that whole time. So they think they're coming into a safe area. This is where that one hour technique could be very productive as long as you don't bump a bunch of deer going in. And that's part of the challenge. I mean, you could already have deer mingling down there by the time you get there. Um, but if you only have an hour, then I would suggest to you one of your strategies this year, have a couple spots like this set up, even if you have more than just one hour to hunt. Let's say um, you have the whole day to hunt, but the conditions aren't right for your spot. Or you can go sit at your spot, and if things don't work out, have that spot close by. You can pop over to that last hour and maybe pull this off. But it's a spot you're not too worried about. If you mess it up a little bit, no big deal. Again, a hunting strategy to try to be more successful, especially if you were on a hunt that maybe would have been blown anyway, Give something like this a try. So you're catching this, um, this low spot on the hill with that thermal coming down. This is going to be especially helpful when you get right in that last week of October where the bucks are starting to get up a little bit earlier, but they're not fully running yet. Um, so again, we're, I'm going to talk more about the pre-rut and rut strategies in later episodes. I don't want to get into that right now. The point I'm making to you is how can you use this thermal to your advantage and how can, again, if you're set up up here for your evening hunt, 
and the deer don't come before that thermal kicks in and you know there's deer movement below you or maybe they're coming up the hill well where they might not have winded you before because of the wind direction now they're winding you because of the thermal so just keep that in mind the first time here let me just clean this up a second one of the first times that i really noticed this i was much younger and i was hunting on the top of a ridge a long running ridge probably went for about a mile and there was a north wind at about five to ten miles an hour so it wasn't bad but i thought if I get as high as I can in a tree on the top of this ridge, I should be good. Like nothing should win me, right? So I'm up here, up in this tree, and I'm thinking if the wind is coming across here, it's just going to keep taking my scent right away. You know, the wind's coming this way, it's just going to take my scent and be way up here and the deer are going to be way down here. And what happened is it was getting into the rut just before and there was no deer movement. I'm like, what is going on? So I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna let out a couple grunts. I let out like two grunts and I just sat there. And then I heard a deer stiff walking. That stiff walking means that, it typically means that a deer is nervous. It knows something isn't right. What happened is, well, it actually it wasn't stiff walking right away. I think a deer heard the grunt and was coming in to check it out. It ended up being like a little four point one and a half year old buck. But he moved in and he got over here on, he was coming across this ridge side and he got below me. And that thermal and the wind, so we had a gentle wind coming across here, you know, kind of swirling my scent down a little bit. And then the thermal was coming down and the deer just winded me. And he just started stiff walking. He's like, something's not right, I'm getting out of here. Um, and that's the whole point. If you are putting a game plan together for your hunt, and you get into that last 45 minutes and he, the thermal's kicking in, just think about how will that impact your effectiveness and where the deer might be. Okay, so that is my little take on thermals. I guess I could have left that drawing up. Um, one other thing I wanna throw in there, and then I'll probably end this because it seems like most places I have, uh, <laughs> dropped. I don't even know if I'm even still broadcasting anywhere. Um, but I'm going to keep going. I'm going to finish this out. Finish what you started. Um, I was in Illinois on a hunt. And now out there you do have topographic changes. It's mostly due to erosion, not through like the plates pushing up into the hills like you have in the east and the west. But I was on a farm and there was a flat area field up here, you know, cut field there. And a little bit of a hillside from here to here is about a 200 yard distance. And the wind was coming at about 20 miles an hour straight this way. The key deer trails across this little hillside were here and here. So I thought if I get between them and I just get high enough in a tree, Anything below me, even though it's on the downwind side, I should be good to go. So I got up in a tree here and I was about right there. And while I was in the stand, I mean, at that point, I'm all, it was a hang on stand. I set it up on site, you know, hanging sticks, portable sticks. You know, it's a major ordeal. All the camera equipment set up and I'm in the stand and I'm facing down this hill. I'm like, I was just looking down the hill. And I could just feel the air, the wind on my neck on a downward, I mean, it was a downward angle. It was driving my scent down to the ground. And I was like, man, I, you know, my idea totally bombed here. Because here's what was happening. The wind was coming across here at 25 miles an hour, but it was lipping off of here and causing that spiral down. It was going right like that. And I could just feel it just, just that, that downward angle so that the air it didn't just blow straight out here because you have all this area down in here that it fills into. So once it gets past that edge, it starts that swirling effect, swirling down and it ruined my hunt. I mean, I had this buck, I think it was about 10 yards away coming on one of the trails below me. And I was a little borderline. He was a three year old eight point, And I was like, man, you know, I wanted to hold out for something a little bit better, but I'm getting near the end of the hunt. And um, so it's coming across and before I could even draw, draw or decide if I'm gonna shoot or not, he stepped and he, as soon as his hoof hit, like straight down into me, he did that, 
spun around and took off running. Ted, the flag went up, you know, and it was because of that, the way that this was impacted, the wind was impacting that. So I wanted to throw that into because although I hunt a lot on the east and a lot of what I've talked about is going to really impact hilly and mountainous areas, I also want to throw it in for you to think about if you're out in the Midwest or something and you have more like this type of stuff if you have any topographic changes at all. So there you have it. Um, that's my little presentation on wind direction and thermals and I hope that it's helped. It seems like since we lost a lot of the fees, let me just make sure I don't have any questions. Um, Okay, so I don't know, like my wife was going to be texting me the questions and she has lost the feeds. Um, so at this point, if you've had any questions, first of all, I apologize for the glitch here. But um, you can either email them to me, seansoutdooradventures.com is my website. Um, I'm going to make sure this video gets posted on my YouTube channel, even if I have to. I was smart enough to hit record on the video camera before I started. <laughs> so I will take the footage and post it to my channel if it did not air, if it did not um, get fed there. And so it's going to be there. And while it's there, you can feel free to make a comment underneath. I will be back next week. And I'm going to have some surprise announcements, which I'm very looking forward to making. And um, coming out next, if you want to stay tuned uh, through the Bowtech feeds, um, Surefire Recipes is coming up. And tonight they're doing applewood smoked venison. I'm salivating just thinking about it. So uh, make sure you check that out. I want to thank you for joining me. And those of you who have been in through it all, uh, thank you so much. God bless you. And I look forward to seeing you again. And now I'm going to try to figure out how to turn this thing off. So you're going to kind of look at my face right now as I figure this out. But God bless you. Goodbye.